Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think we better start because it's been a long day for you too. And uh, I just would like to invite Professor Pile just to say a few words to open the center. And uh, uh, then I'll be saying a few words about the center and then hand it on to Professor Michael Apple. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great uh, pleasure to be able to open the, this formal session and to welcome our guest from, from abroad in the US, who is professor in more than one place in the world. And it's very good to have um, Michael with us this afternoon. Um, we gather to commemorate the founding of the Paolo Freire Center here at the university as part of the Faculty of Education and um, there are many synergies that come to mind. Um, uh, Paulo Freire, as you know, was a Brazilian philosopher and educationist, and uh, the founder and the visionary behind our center here is also from Brazil, um, Dr. Alex Guilherm, and um, he brings with him not just um, a membership of the faculty, but he brings with him this broader vision of having grown up in Brazil and having a great acquaintance with the ethos and philosophy of Paulo Freire. Of course, calling a center Paulo Freire is not uncontroversial, because, as you know, his own writings um, are taken and read differently by different parts of our international community. You'd expect a center like this to exist in developing countries where the question of reconstruction and renewal of society is a living issue. There is one in uh, South Africa, and you can understand that, based uh, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. There are a few centres in Europe. The significance of the centre is that it is here in Britain, in a so-called first world, uh, old Europe, in a place where we're not faced with a kind of revisionist questions, say, South Americans are faced with. And yet, I'm more than convinced that Paulo Freire's message is as relevant here in Britain as it is in South America. How can we not pick up um, ped the pedagogy of the oppressed, or his perhaps more accessible book, The Politics of Education, written in 1985, and not be uh, drawn to his insatiable quest for education as dialogue, uh, his uh, rejection of the so-called banking model of education, uh, his um, great understanding of praxis, not as just activism, but praxis as informed action, where the kind of dichotomies we in the West still live with, what is theory and what is practice, what is teacher education and what is school placements, uh, how much of theory and where do we place students. That's kind of typical um, uh, Western dichotomies. But when we have a notion of informed action, then we go beyond that because formation, and even, as we say sometimes, transformation, goes beyond this dichotomy between theory and practice. But if we read Paulo Freire again with fresh eyes, there is so much we can inform developed society like ours. I'm also drawn to Paulo Freire because as a theologian, I, I can't help reading him without um, seeing how often he borrows Christian metaphor, like when he speaks about having to first die so that things can be reborn. And he speaks even about the Easter experience of the educator, the Easter experience. Now, the, you know, you've got to understand the New Testament to understand the great dynamism of that metaphor. In one of his last interviews that Paulo Freire give, gave, which for me captures why we are all academics who are paid at this university to think, to think. I know we have to fill in forms and we've got to do all kinds of things, but our, we really are paid to think and to translate the excitement of thinking to those who come here to study. In his last interview, he said, I was curious as a boy and I am now curious as an old man. He died uh, literally a few, few months, a few weeks after giving that interview. 
Paulo Freire is known for his pedagogy of, of the oppressed, but he also more than once called it the pedagogy of hope. And uh, it's a wonderful thing to think that we can, at this university, call by this wonderful name, hope, that we can somehow, through this center, recover a pedagogy of hope. It affects every teacher education st member of staff, but it should affect every academic at this university to understand and, and, and deeply engage with um, a pedagogy of hope. A few days ago, excuse me going on a bit, but a few days ago we also lost another great Brazilian uh, the, uh, uh, liberation theologian, Father Libanio. He died of a heart attack, at, I think it was 81, just a few days ago. It was uh, this liberation theologian echoing Paulo Freire's message, who began his book on education with the following sentence, if, I'm, if I remember it correctly, saying, we, how can we create a critical frame, a, a mind with a critical framework, and how can, how can we create the educator as, with a critical mind and a critical framework, rather than a cupboard that stores bits of information? bits of knowledge. And that was deeply behind what Paulo Freire, after whom he named our center, was asking all his life until he too died um, uh, in 97. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a great moment, I think, in the life of the faculty, but also in the life of the university, where somebody like uh, Dr. Alex Gillerm, coming from the same world of Paulo Freire, comes here to Liverpool, comes here to our university, and challenges us with the center. I hope it will be a, a place where academics will gather, not just from education, but from right across the disciplines to recover a pedagogy, perhaps not of the oppressed as Paulo Freire understood it, but a pedagogy of hope. So, welcome. Thank you very much, Professor Pillay. Um, I don't want to go on, on long too much, but uh, I need to say a few words as well about the, Fre the, the Paulo Freire Center. And uh, uh, this is a very exciting moment for me. And uh, you know, seeing you all here reminds me a little bit from when I was a student at the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, Paulo Freire, of course, was a professor there at the time. And uh, it was soon after Brazil became a democracy again, and we were very idealistic, and uh, we thought we could change the world in those days. And uh, we all used to, you know, flock down to the main hall of the University of São Paulo, which is a very large campus, you know, with this three bus line is, lines uh, in the universe. So we all used to walk down just to hear Paulo Freire, and uh, sometimes Marilena Schaui as well, who is one of the main philosophers in Brazil. And so it was very exciting for us and uh, of course, soon after, Paulo Freire became Secretary of Education of the City of Sao Paulo when the Workers' Party became, uh, won the elections. And uh, it was a phenomenal time for us because uh, uh, the change, the mood of the city changed overnight, literally. Uh, there was a, a huge sense of community and that things were going to change for the better. So, you know, uh, having Michael here uh, giving his talk on the task of the critical scholar and activist in education resonates a lot with me and it brings up memories from those student days when I was a student at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, also, the, the center started running in October and uh, we now have a seminar series running throughout the year. Uh, there'll be a colloquium on language and identity in May. And uh, we have also a big conference happening in June with people like uh, Gert Bista, Paul Smyers, uh, Craig Calhoun, and John Holmwood coming as keynote speakers. So it's a very big conference for us. Um, this particular lecture, Michael's Apple to me is the icing on the cake this year, you know, like because you couldn't get, in my opinion, a, a bigger name to come. So, you know, it's 
uh, with the icing on the cake for me. And uh, this lecture is being streamed to the uh, Faculty of Education at the uh, Catholic University in Lima. And uh, some of the other faculties are watching it as well. So it's an in international event as well. And uh, I'm trying to build links now with some of the universities in Brazil, the University of Sao Paulo, the Federal in Santa Catarina, and the Catholic in the south of Brazil as well. So we have some partners already established this year. Um, now, uh, finally, I would like to say thank you to, to a few people. Uh, one is Wendy Big Node, and the other is Bart Magetrick, who were very supportive uh, when the center was just a project and uh, gave me a lot of advice. So thank you very much to Wendy and Bart. I also would like to say thank you to the Vice Chancellor and to uh, Professor Newport for trusting me uh, with getting the center up and running and with the original funding for us to get the center on the go. And um, I think that's it from me. And uh, without further ado, I would like to pass the word to Professor Michael Apple, who will be talking, uh, uh, giving his talk, The Task of the Critical Scholar, Activist in Education, uh, which is based on his latest book, Can Education Change Society? And I just remind you that after the lecture, there will be a book signing event uh, just across uh, on the main hall there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And in conclusion, uh, no. all right, it is a pleasure to be here for a variety of reasons. First, because of my friendship with Paolo Ferrari, to honor him is something that uh, one dreams of doing. Uh, my first experience in Brazil was in 1985 when the military government was still in power and I went to Porto Alegre to work with PT, the Workers' Party, the Teachers' Union, and with the uh, Universidad Federal de Rio Grande do Sul. And my office was the office of the military censor, Colonel Parada. And everything in education, every lecture, had to be written and given to the censor, and he would mark it up. And I had the pleasure of reading his notes to political too political. This is not education. Too political. It's not dentistry. It's not law. It's not social work. It's not medicine. He was the censor of the professionals. Three months later, the colonel was in jail. I cannot say anything more profound or more beautiful than that. So this is actually quite important, quite, excuse me, quite in the US means very. I, uh, <laughs> I have too many memories of sending a letter to Basil Bernstein saying his work was quite interesting and then receiving an intercontinental ballistic missile back <laughs> saying that I had no right to comment on his work. So if I do say quite, please remember it is uh, from the colonies, okay. <laughs> Um, the second reason it is a joy to be here um, is also because this university is an alliance, a historic place where hope is actually attempted to be taken seriously, where dialogue and social justice is not simply discursive but is meant to be taken seriously. And as someone who went to a small teacher's college at night for my undergraduate degree, at a place that tried very hard to form an alliance with the black communities and the diaspora communities of my home city, Patterson, New Jersey, the home of the first communist strikes in the United States, being here is a way of giving back to my influences as well because it brings back the memories of why I am standing before you and of the teachers I had who believed in many of the things that this university stands for. 
There is a third reason for being here that I enjoy very much, and that is when my grandfather left Russia and could not get a visa to the United States, he came to Manchester, Huddersfield, and the document of his immigration papers to Patterson, New Jersey, said that he left on a ship from Liverpool. So thank you, grandfather. And uh, I, this then is dedicated to Mr. Benjamin Rusak, communist and anti-racist organizer, labor union leader, and my first teacher. So thank you. In my talk today, I want to do a variety of things. Um, first, I want to rehearse briefly some of the arguments I've made before about whether education can change society, and my answer will be a resounding yes. I am not a cynic about that. But I think the right is proving that constantly. It is the left that I worry about. And then I want to talk about not what other people should do, since I think most critical educators have made horrible mistakes by talking what impoverished people should do. I want to talk about what we should do, knowing that the we is a place marker for a very complicated set of relationships. So I want to talk about what is it that people who arrogate to themselves this space, what we should do, and to try and make a, nature, make a series of arguments about our responsibility, knowing that I will try to be as contentious as hell. So if you're not angry, then I've failed. That's a joke. Um, you'll forgive me, my style is one in the East Coast of the United States, making a joke has to have a little knife. Otherwise, it's not funny. And with a last name like Apple, um, <laughs> my first teaching activity was after I was gaily drummed out of the United States military after finishing my work. Uh, you are looking at Sergeant Apple, unfortunately, at one time of my life. And because I had been trained by the Army to be a teacher, I was hired with no university degree one year of college at a small state teacher's college. Um, and because this was a time when it was seen that men had to be in the black and brown communities of the United States, whether they could speak or not. And I could say, como esta, which is all I could say in Espanol. Um, when you go in, I was a supply teacher. So every morning I had to call at 6 a.m. and call up the local Ministry of Education, and they would tell me what classroom to go to. If you go into a new classroom every day and uh, introduce yourself to a group of five or six or seven years old children and say, hello, kids, my name is Mr. Apple, you must have a very bad sense of humor because it will take three hours for the children to leave the light fixtures as they are hanging from them. So you'll forgive this, but do not misinterpret my humble attempts at being interesting and occasionally badly humored. This is serious and deadly stuff, truly serious. And Paolo, who had a wicked sense of humor and just as juvenile as mine, would appreciate at least the attempts. So, let me go on and now try and deal with a much more formal and I hope more interesting set of assertions. Over the last 30 to 40 years, I've asked simple questions. Those questions go something like this. Whose knowledge is taught? Whose knowledge is not taught? Who benefits from those relations? What is the relationship between education inside of schools, in community literacy practices, in families, and relations of dominance and subordination in the larger society and to attempts at interrupting those relations. This, these questions have a very, very long history. And part of the task of Paolo and myself was to keep the river of critical democracy flowing so that those questions not only get asked, even though in the current neoliberal agenda we are losing our collective memory, not of the answers, but even of the questions, but I've also tried to ask another kind of question. What can we do about this? What is our role? 
And in many ways, it seems to me that the fundamental question has been, can education change society? And I think, by and large, we have lived through 20 to 30 years where a group of people have said profoundly that education is a fundament of social transformation. But let us remember that revolutions move backwards, not only forward. We have faced, in almost every nation of the world, including Brazil, England, every nation, a movement backwards, a movement towards what I have called conservative modernization, that is a new hegemonic block, a new alliance in power that is pushing almost every part of a society in a particular direction that I find, you'll forgive these words, repulsive and unethical. Where even the Bible, even religious texts, are used to justify statements that would have been unsayable and sometimes even unthinkable before. So in my own nation, we hear quotes, for instance, that white men are the new oppressed. We hear statements that diasporic populations are crossing our borders and taking our rightful jobs, that their culture is polluting what it means to be American, British, etc. You'll forgive the etc. So we are facing, facing powerfully a group of people that Paolo spent his entire life fighting against. Now, in my talk today, as I go through this and talk about the task of interrupting this, I want in many ways to state overtly and honestly, I will not be restating what Paolo said. I am assuming you know what Paolo said, even if it's simply sentences or ideas. The task of anyone who wants to respect Paolo Freire is to stand on his shoulders to offer what we hope are new connections, building on his work. The task is not simply repetition. As he said to me over our 18th cup of coffee, where I was like this and so was he, but not because of the coffee, he was engaged. As he said, Michael, do not be a clone. No one must be a clone. That is not the role of education. Your task is to go beyond me. If I am a teacher and you do, you will be my child. Now, I don't like the infantilization that goes with that, but I do understand what it means to face a great teacher who reminds all of us that the task is to go the next step and the next step and the next step, and sometimes to reject the stairs. So let me go on. This new hegemonic block has four elements, and I want to just say a bit about each one and then talk about what our, our role is in interrupting them. What I call conservative modernization has four elements, pressing education and all things social in particular directions. And we want to think of this using the metaphor of an umbrella. For almost everyone in education, it is raining outside. If one is a teacher, one is disrespected. Jobs are being lost. Mr. Gove says, I have never seen a teacher worthy of respect. It is raining for teachers. For capital, you'll forgive me for using that term, I know that's bad talk. For capital, schools and educational institutions are black holes into which money is poured and PISA scores do not come out. For diasporic parents, I quote now, and as the father of an African-American child, this is more than simply theoretical to my wife and myself. As my friends say, there is cultural genocide going on. I do not see myself in this text. For parents in general, there is great fear as the economy sheds jobs massively. It is raining in education. And the task of dominant groups is to engage in what that great theorist of France, if it's French, it must be important, as we know, 
Louis Althusser, that's Mad Louis, as he is also known, he killed his wife, a minor infraction theory. And as Louis said, the task is beckoning to do this, to say there's many umbrellas out there. I must convince you through vast pedagogic work, very creative pedagogic work, to come out of the rain under not Michael Apple's umbrella, not the umbrella that many of us in this audience would love, not the umbrella of the university that is joining us in Peru. Hola, compadres. Right? But an umbrella that says that private is good and public is bad. A different umbrella. So there are four groups involved in a massive and very creative pedagogic project. Social pedagogy using pedagogy to transform society. The first of these groups, if we think of this umbrella as having four hands on it, the one with the biggest and strongest hands are what we call historically neoliberals. They believe one thing, private is necessarily good and public is necessarily bad. And part of that is to change our identities powerfully, to take words that have an emotional economy, such as democracy, to keep the word, this bottle is democracy, pour out democratic meanings committed to participatory form, to dialogue, to working together to build our institutions, pour that water out, those meanings out, and pour in new meanings. Democracy is not full participation with a commitment to social justice. Democracy is purchasing on a market. Education is one more commodity, like a rover, or toilet paper, or a bottle of water. And the more we can bring corporate strategies and a corporate agenda into education, the more I can change your identity into being seen as a consumer, the more we will have democracy. That is a vast pedagogic project, and it is remarkably successful. Ten years ago, if I spoke to people in London or Manchester or Liverpool or Lincoln or Plymouth and said, say, what do you think about academies and free schools? They would have laughed. They're not laughing now. They're sending their children to them. All right? The second element doesn't have this vision necessarily of a weak state. It has a vision of a strong state. Consumption practices are crucial, but those practices in many ways must be guided by a search for return, a conservative cultural project, what we might call neoconservatives. And neoconservatives believe that the only way we can restore order and profound understanding to our educational apparatus to our children and our nation is to build that eloquent fiction a common culture, to go backwards, not forwards, to misunderstand the history of this great nation and nations to be, perhaps, and the diasporic populations that make England a vast experiment. The question is an experiment in what? For whom? There never was a common culture here. Let us hope there is not a forced one now. In my own nation, for instance, there are 152 languages taught in the schools of Los Angeles and New York. I take that as a sign of a vast pedagogic experiment in social justice. The empire has indeed come home. Thank goodness. We now are a nation of people. It is not imposed. It must be built. As Raymond Williams remind us, reminds us, what is common is the process of asking the question, what is common? And for every generation, that commonness must be built. It may be based on sacred texts of a multiplicity of sacred texts but it must be discussed and it must be arrived at without imposition. So this second element then, profoundly powerful, 
has a cultural agenda. Yes, it is capitalism and everything will be commodified, but we will commodify Michael's culture, not someone else's. So it is, if you will, an elision of what pedagogy is about, the dialogue between groups and people. There's a third group that is very important for me to mention here, and that is what Stuart Hall, someone who also must be mentioned as a brilliant political being and another friend who has been lost recently, what he would call authoritarian populists. These are groups who believe that what is wrong with schools and society is we have lost our religious way. Only through the restoration of God can a society be destroyed. Now, do not misinterpret what I say here. I work with religious activists throughout the world, with Muslim activists in Turkey, with Palestinian activists who are deeply religious, with Jewish Peace Now activists, right? with liberation theologists and communities and base communities throughout Latin America. Right? But authoritarian populists believe that God only speaks to them, not to anyone else. And the fastest growing school reform in the United States is homeschooling. Teachers, I quote, are tools of the devil. Three million children are being schooled at home by evangelical parents who have never heard the evangelical message. That is also powerful and religiously very interesting. This is a capturing of religious impulses into a form of oppressive circumstance. And they also are extraordinarily powerful, and they believe as well that the role of the state is to be shrunken. Only choice on a market will enable their religion to be powerful. And obviously, this is worldwide. It happens in Pakistan. It happens in Israel and Palestine. It happens in Turkey. It happens all over. There is a fourth group, and that is a group that we might call a particular fraction of the professional and managerial middle class. They believe in audit cultures. They believe in one simple thing. If it moves in classrooms and schools, measure it. And if it hasn't moved yet, measure it anyway in case it moves again tomorrow. This is PISA scores. This is GOV, the restoration of the national curriculum and the national test. It is making a vast swimming pool and saying the only way to get children to do better and community literacy programs to do better is to double the size of the pool at the same time as I take the money away from teachers and schools and universities and give it to Pearson and company, the real ministry of education in the UK. Okay. For those of you in Peru, um, we hope that Pearson is translating this material into Espanol because we want to see you as sources of profit as well. Okay. <sighs> I could stop there. I could, uh, okay. okay. We joke about this, but teacher education now in the United States, the test that all future teachers must take to become licensed, they must spend $300, and the test is produced by Pearson. Even at my august, quite radical university, the University of Wisconsin. So I'm in favor of Pearson. I think they're very good. And I'm going out to buy as many shares as possible. And my role, instead of signing books after my lecture, I plan to sell shares. Um, so I'm, I better stop now. Okay. All right, now. So this alliance is actually quite profound and very, very powerful, very powerful. Now the question is, what next? Yes, we can bear, we can say, how horrible it is. Hmm. What else do we do? Now I must return to Paolo's demand. The task is not simply to talk about oppression, though we must. We must do something about it. So in the next part of this talk, I want to talk about what do we do about it and who is the we. Since the most contentious, 
the most contentious concept in the English language and in every language of the world is the term of both inclusion and exclusion, the word we. As Judith Butler reminds us, as Ben Yabib reminds us, as many, many people have reminded us, all concepts have constitutive outsides. To have the arrogance of saying whiteness is the human ordinary, I must have its opposite, people of color. In fact, liberalism and now neoliberalism, as Charles Mills reminds us in a brilliant book, a brilliant book right, called The Racial Contract, reminds us that our very ideas of democracy are based on an othering. Neoliberalism and liberalism depends on the rational individual, this vision of someone who is worthy of rights because she or he, usually he, traditionally, is rational. But in order to use a term like rational, we must have a term called the irrational. There must be its opposite. And it is not uninteresting that at the time of Hobbes and Locke, the British Empire was colonizing the space of the irrational. Liberalism depends on the black other. So there is a history of this. It's very, very important. So we must begin to think about how do we construct our role? How do we learn? What is our responsibility? What is the responsibility following the path blazed so brilliantly by Paolo, what should we be doing? I want to list nine acts. This is a temporary model, and it's developed in Can Education Change Society? Uh, let me say one thing about that. You'll forgive me for being a bit self-referential. The lecture is based on the book. Uh, the, I was about to say the other Professor Apple, the real Professor Apple, and that is Professor Rima Apple, who is there. That's my my wife, um, who is a historian of medicine and of women's health. Um, both Rima and I made a decision early on in our career. We accept no money from our books, lectures, honoraria, etc. They all go to social movements. Uh, the violence against women shelter near our home, homeless shelters, social mobilizations. So if you'll forgive me, it's not that I want to drive a Mercedes, though anyone who would like to give me one, I'll be happy to take it for a spin. Um, but uh, um, that was not a joke. Right? <laughs> I grew up poor in Patterson, New Jersey. Poor working class young men have very, very diseased minds about cars, and big engines, and other things. Um, so I've, I've had to reconstruct myself. I'm now a gentle human being. And being from the United States, that gentleness is translated into I have many guns. Okay, okay. all right. I told you the humor would be bad. Okay, all right, let me go on. So there are nine points that I want to refer to. So let me develop the argument about what we should be doing. The first is a simple one, and it's one that we are actually very good at. It must bear witness to negativity, a biblical term in many ways, that is one of the primary functions of any work at any agency, is to illuminate the ways in which educational policy and practice is connected to the relations of exploitation and domination in the larger society and to struggles against such relations in that society. That is, we must tell the truth. The postmodern theory effect that it's all a bunch of stories reminds us that Michael Apple must not be the maitre d' telling which people go to what table, but it also has some very damaging consequences. That all truth is relative, it's just a bunch of stories. The only people who can say that are people who don't have to live in the favelas, who don't have to live in the slums of Liverpool who have not lost their jobs, who are not exploited for both paid and unpaid domestic labor. So part of the task is to remind ourselves 
There are truths that need to be told, and we must tell them. That is not to dismiss the postmodern and poststructural criticisms, but it is to remind ourselves about the gritty materiality that Paolo spent his life struggling for and against, and that the hope that is embodied in this brilliant institution is also a hope that we must transform something and we must tell the truth about what that something is. Even if we cannot change it, we must bear witness to it. And that requires an ethical sensibility that is not simply, uh, it requires a commitment. Now in engaging in these critical analyses, the second point, it seems to me that is not sufficient to simply bear witness to negativity, we must point to contradictions, to spaces of possible action. That is one of the aims in which we must, we must perform, is to examine critical realities with a framework that emphasizes the spaces in which more progressive and counter-hegemonic actions can and do go on. We must document these spaces, otherwise the result is cynicism. Or as my children used to say, you'll forgive these vulgar terms, but I'm now quoting from my children. I wonder where they got this word from. It's called daddy's oh shit response. Right? Whenever I listen to you, I just want to say, oh shit. It is, you'll forgive that. I know none of you have ever heard that word before. But you'll, you know, you'll, you'll forgive the vulgarity, but it is the sense of our task is not to create more cynicism. In fact, neoliberalism does a very, very good job of that. We are the world to court, the only world possible. Well, that is not our task. The world is not a world of reproduction. It is a world of contradiction. There are spaces for action. After all, why is Gove and the neoliberal agenda attacking schools of education? attacking teachers' unions, attacking teachers if there weren't victories. If we were already doing what they wanted, wouldn't they simply be applauding? If people of color in this nation, if diasporic populations, hadn't won major victories already, why would go be calling upon teachers and others to, to rid the curriculum of the stuff that's not, in quotes, real knowledge, the knowledge that he got at the prep school. So clearly there are spaces of action. And part of our task as well is to do an analysis that doesn't just say, but says here and here and here are important things going on. If we don't do that, we actually perform exactly what the people who want to transform backwards want us to do. And that would be an unmitigated disaster in many ways. Let me remind us that many times schools and education is a victory. So in the United States, for instance, where we were South Africa, we were an apartheid nation, and economically in many ways we still are, but for Afro-Caribbean and African heritage people who were enslaved, there is no word as slave. Someone must make one enslaved. Slavery is, a, is not a noun, it's a verb. And it is acted against all the time. But to become literate meant that you risk death. Pedagogy schools were a victory, not only a defeat. And the task of white dominant institutions was to win that victory back. And they've been relatively successful in doing that, unfortunately, in many nations. So we must point to the spaces where people act. And we must document those spaces, which leads me to the third point. And that is part of the task is to transform what counts as research so that we become partly the critical secretaries of those victories, of the gains. Not simply showing the spaces, not simply showing the negativity, 
But as Paolo did in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he said, look, this is what is going on in favelas, in rural communities. I must show you, I must document, almost in diaries, this is what I am doing. This is what not just I am doing, this is what we are doing through dialogue, through co-teaching that interrupts dominance and subordination. This is what good literacy work does. And what made his work so powerful was not just the engagement, but it actually answered the question that many teachers ask, and I think too many progressives think is a bad question. It is not a bad question at all. It is an absolutely crucial question. What do I do when I enter the school? What do I do on Monday? What do I do in the community literacy program? If that's the only question you ask, it is a disaster. But too many of my friends who say they are on the left feel as if schools are forms of pollution, that curriculum issues are forms of pollution. Why would I muddy my hands? How, how, could, I, how could I do serious work if my hands are polluted with the real life of institutions such as schools, curriculum, teachers, etc., If that's all one does, that is very dangerous. But we are not slumming when we are talking about the real lives of people who are devoting their lives to schools and literacy. So part of our task in many ways then is to be organic with people who may not be in this room, and some of you may be in this room. But part of our task then is to challenge what counts as valuable research. That means that while this university wants to add even more responsibility to itself, and rightly so, to become as well a research university Powerfully so, but research with an ethical edge. Another reason I'm so pleased to be here. Right? But in doing so, it means also the rejection of the metrics of what we have all just been through, the REF, where they have never seen anything that's over 25 pages that they think is good, where high-impact journals become the marker of good research. Well, a certain professor, Michael W. Apple, the W stands for Whitman, the poet of New Jersey, the profane embodied poet of New Jersey. Right? My first articles that ultimately became a relatively well-known book called Ideology and Curriculum were in journals no one had ever heard of. The reason being that in order to do the new things, the high-impact journals may not publish those things. Okay? So part of what we must do is to say for permanent positions, for promotion, what counts as good research? And I'm claiming that one of the things that must go on, aside from the powerful conceptual work that must go on, the powerful historical and empirical qualitative and quantitative work that must go on, some of, must, must, some of it must also be documentary. It must be, this is what critical work looks like in real centers, in real communities, in real classrooms with real teachers and real problems. So of all the books I have done, there's a little book called Democratic Schools, a tiny book. It's 100 pages. It has sold 500,000 copies. But that's not money for me. But it does document that in real schools and real communities, including in Brazil, in China, in Korea, in the US, through the OU here, there are half a million teachers who are saying, I don't like what I'm being asked to do. But I don't remember what it looks like to do something different. 
What do I do with the test, the tail of the test wagging the dog of the teacher? What do I do? And part of our task as critical secretaries, and critical is just as important, not simply accepting it, is also to say this is what an interruptive strategy looks like. And unless we also attempt collectively to do that, this is what we get. That's so good, Professor Apple, in theory. But I face something that's not theoretical every day. As Paolo reminded us, and the word that was so nicely used in your introductory remarks, praxis is the operative, not just metaphor, but way of being in the world. One is constantly in concert with, in deliberation with, living in, not outside. And to be in education means that we also must think about and be in that space. Because that space is what defines us. And that space is an interactive space. Okay, so, now, this, this idea then of changing what counts as research is risky. So for instance, people's careers are on the line here. So new people at the institutions in England, where I'm also a professor, at the Institute of Education in Manchester, are told immediately, you will be judged on how much money you bring in. Hmm. Now, unfortunately, that is the reality. Because neoliberals will shrink the space of possibility. So it requires not just the ethical response to real people's lives who believe in these things, but also, in many ways, understanding that real people's lives also need support. And that may require institutional transformations and real ethical assistance. Because we cannot ask younger people to make the sacrifices and then say, I'm sorry, go find another position. And that is predictably happening at other institutions where I go that would be a disaster. On the other hand, to preserve the institution means that you also, in a time of neoliberal attack on the public sphere, that money coming in will protect centers like this. That's very difficult. We must find ways tactically of dealing with reality to protect the spaces that are victories. And this institute is a major victory an ethical response to what is happening to everyone's lives. It's okay, it's the National Security Agency just <laughs> checking up. The, the microphones weren't picking up our voices quite as well. Um, no, so, anyway, okay. I wish that was a joke. Okay, all right. Now, all of this was an attempt, you know, the first three of these, an attempt to say, so practically, what are we about? Well, practically, we also have to recognize, it seems to me, that our task is not to commit intellectual suicide. That is, some of this is humbling. There are people in real schools we must learn from. The we must include that. We must give of ourselves in many ways to document the powerful things that may be going on and that need to be defended. But we have made sacrifices to be here. Everyone in this room is here because of other people's labor as well as our own. And part of our task is to give that expertise back. Not to be so self-effacing that we have this false humbleness that anything we know now is not valuable. This is not a game, understanding these things, doing good theory, doing good teaching at a university, doing the ethical research that is excuse me, so important, is not a game. There is a reason it must be done. And that means part of our task is to give that back. And here I must tell a personal story that I often get emotional about. I must tell a story of Harry Apple, gentle communist, who was also the father of Michael Apple. 
I'm the first generation finishing secondary school on time in my family, but I come from a family of printers, the most radical working class occupation historically. Grandfather was a printer, father was a printer, I worked as a printer while I went to university at night. Very valuable history. And as with many of you, after another book came out, I went to see my father, and there was a shrine to me. As you walk into his little apartment before he died, there's a bookcase, iconic. The books of Michael and Rima Apple. I don't know what to do with that. I'm proud and embarrassed. But at the same time, I'd just been working in schools. And I looked at my father and I said, Harry, you know, I got into this because I was, when I say Harry, he knows it's serious now. Right? It's like when he says, Michael, you run screaming from the room. Okay? And he says, and I say to him, look, I got into this because I was so angry about the way teachers were treated and the, what, the, what I was being asked to teach. It had no bearing on the community where I was teaching. I was teaching in all African American and Latino and Latina school, in the slums, the schools I went to. And I said, I'm not certain I can do this anymore. I could see the difference when I walked into a classroom every day. When a kid who had not been taught how to read was taught how to read critically at the same time, I knew I helped do that. But in a lecture hall like this, I don't know that it was me. Quite an egotistical statement. I said, I'm not certain this is worth it. The gentle communist, Harry Apple, who wore a tie to his demonstrations because poor people had to look respectable, looked at me, you'll forgive this again, I'm quoting from my father who never swore in his life. It's the first time I ever heard him say this word. So I apologize, and especially in a religious institution, I feel odd even saying this. I should feel odd saying it anywhere. Harry Apple, gentle, gentle printer, says, Michael, what the fuck did you just say? I said, what? And you could see his body like this. Michael, I'll say it again. What the fuck did you just say? That sort of gets your attention. He said, look, your mother and I sacrificed all our lives for you to get into that night school. We continue to sacrifice. I worked three jobs. Your mother was a leader and demonstrator. Your role is to give it back to us. That is your debt. I never want to hear you doubt that in public again. Your responsibility because of our sacrifices is to give back to the community from where you came. That's the most brilliant thing I have ever heard in my life. That rivals Paolo's words. And in fact, they are almost exactly the same words. One in Portuguese, one in English. So part of our task is not the false modesty. It is to remember that we all stand on the shoulders of other people who have sacrificed, men and women who have worked to get us here. We may not know them. We may not remember them. They may no longer be with us, or they may be someone we see every day. But we must pay our debts. I am paid through public funds. That means everything I know, everything I know has already been paid for by people working in homes, in farms, in schools, in churches, in mosques, in synagogues, I must pay back. And part of that, our task, 
is to pay the debt by giving back in understandable ways as often as we can to the communities who have incurred the labor and who have worked so hard so that people like us, the we, with them can be here. All right? Okay. That is Paolo's stance as well. Otherwise, why write? Okay. Now, part of this as well is to say, well, we must also do this in the same way that we keep memories alive and traditions alive. So that I began this by talking about neoliberals. And part of the task in many ways is to remember that one of the most creative things that neoliberals and neoconservatives have done is the destruction of collective memory, of telling us that all of the things we knew about social justice, about Freire's work, about all of the work of religious forms that have formed this institution, that all of that is meaningless in a society where everything needs to be commodified, where all that is solid is profaned. See, I blew it, my favorite quote. All that is sacred is profaned and all that is solid melts in the air. To lose the traditions that have formed us. So we must keep alive the traditions that have formed us. Whether they are religious, critical, philosophical, family-based, we must keep these traditions alive in a society that cares about traditions only if they can be bought and sold the Disneyland of traditions. Paolo had no patience with commodified traditions. Traditions are rebuilt and they are lived. And if they are not lived, they should never be sold. So our task in many ways is to keep alive all of those things. We are not and must not be accused of heresy, of keeping false traditions, useless traditions alive. And the heresy of the market is if it can't be a profit, that's P-R-O-F-I-T, a different meaning of profit. Okay? If it is not profitable, it is not worthy. So feminist traditions, religious traditions, Marxist traditions, liberation theological traditions, traditions of indigenous communities saying, me and I, we, will not be incorporated ever totally in your false commonness. We must keep an identity that we form the common become crucial. And this is why, even though I have uh, get a little worried by some postmodern and post-structural theories, I have much to learn from them. I am not in a church, at least not in my academic career. I should not be worried about heresy. Our task is what might be called decentered unities. What is the dialogue that can go on? What can I be taught? As one example, and I say this with great shame, because of the tradition from which I come, which is critical cultural studies and neo-Marxist analysis. I'm the former president of a teacher's union. I thought that I understood the world largely in class terms and in anti-racist terms. But on my first trip to South Africa, when I went to visit a school and realized there are no teachers in the township, half of them were infected or had died from an HIV infection, not because of anything in quotes that they had done, but because large pharmaceutical companies wanted profit off of teachers' deaths. It was clear to me that the politics of bodies and sexuality were crucial to my understanding of what is oppressive and what is not. 
that I could not even think about schools and particular nations unless I understood the combination of multiple traditions of understanding this. I say that publicly with great shame. Why did it take me so long to understand this struggle? And part of our task is to be taught by the multiplicity of these struggles, not to be the maitre d. You sit there, I'll get to you later. We don't have time for the laterness. There's a multiplicity of oppressions. Let's talk to each other about that. Let's form the alliance. The right is very good at forming alliances. As my grandfather's favorite joke reminded me, Michael, when the left forms a firing squad, it lines up in a circle. We're very good at killing each other. We don't need the right to do it. I have no patience with that anymore. Can we get beyond that? Okay. Now, in doing this, it means we have to develop other skills, journalistic skills, media skills, popular skills to complement our, our academic skills. One of the reasons that neoliberals win is they control the media. If I spoke all the time in my academic best, some people would love it and other people would say, what the hell did he just say? So part of our task is also to understand that education goes on not simply in these kinds of institutions, but the discourses that circulate are dominant. Reality is like an old style Sony walk person. It, uh, walk man. Um, right? And there's 100 stations, 99 are saying education is dumb, teachers are bad, kids are undisciplined, parents don't care. None of that is largely true. And it takes a lot of hard work to find the one station that's playing the alternative. We must reoccupy those waves. So uh, in Can Education Change Society and another book called Educating the Right Way, Market Standards, God and Inequality, I talk about the critical media project where we are struggling to regain that. I'm almost done, I promise. There's only 457 pages left to go. This is my Foucaultian moment. I control the water. I was hoping for vodka, but, uh, you know, um, and I control your bodies. It's very important. This is the only power that academics have. Okay? All right, so three more. This also calls upon us to act in concert with these progressive social movements, but not just giving stuff that people don't have, our knowledge, though as I said, I think that's actually quite important, quite again in the US sense. But how do we learn? As Paolo says, we must be, the pedagogue must be a learner. How do we learn as well? How do we increase the we so that we are no longer the teachers but the learners? We must act in concert. And that means we must not live on the balcony. To live on the balcony, Karl Mannheim's vision of the unattached intelligentsia. We will stand here looking down. It reminds me of Bakhtin's brilliant analysis of the balcony in his book Rabelais and His World, where Bakhtin says, the history of the balcony, that architectural form, speaks to exactly Bourdieu's vision of the finely honed body who has tastes, but no connection to people with a different habitus. The balcony as a form grows in medieval Europe during a time of carnival. The one time during the year when the sacred, in quotes, authority relations of the kings and queens could be talked back to, where carnival was the profane image where people could walk through the villages holding large balloons made of animal skins. And those balloons would be parodies of the king and queen, the dukes and duchesses. And the queen would have male genitalia. And when they were squeezed, they would make a rude noise. And the king would have pendulous breasts. And when the breasts were squeezed, 
They would sound like someone was engaged in a toilet kind of activity. It was the time, the one weeks, that one, one could talk back. It was also the time of the emerging new bourgeoisie who developed a new form of architecture over the street. Look at the carnival. Look at people speaking back to power. Smell the smells. Hear the songs. Hear the voices. It's so interesting. Am I glad I'm above it all? Our task must be to join as well, not simply to live on the balcony. The last two points, and then I'll conclude. But this also means that we must demonstrate that it's possible to do this by acting as mentors, as models, to the people whom we teach. It's easy to say this in theory. But if Michael says this stuff and then I act foolishly in my classes, It's quickly seen as this is a joke. This is part of the conversion strategy of the new intellectual at the university, saying such good things, but whose political action is related to the keyboard on the computer. I know of no student who doesn't see through that immediately, and no community member who's not going to walk out of the room. So this means in our teaching, we must also embody this. Finally. Forming a new we, stepping beyond and keeping alive the vision that Paolo had for us, also means that we must own our privilege. We must understand that while we are in rooms like this, there are millions of people who are not in rooms like this. How do we open those spaces? How does this space become more open to the people who are not here? We have models of doing this. At my own university of Wisconsin, we have an activist in residence program. I would urge the center here to think about this so that it's not just Michael Apple or other people who write, who come, but people as we do who have indigenous activists, Caribbean community activists from Jamaica, environmental activists, disability rights activists, gay activists, coming and getting a full professor's salary for a month, come and teach us so that we understand what it is like to do what we also need to learn. So at the University of British Columbia, in their First Nation program, the leaders of the indigenous nations are on the governing board. That's really interesting to me, OK? So these are nine tasks. No one singly can do all of them. As Paolo reminded us, to be a critical pedagogue is to reform the we, to put oneself consciously in a position to be a learner, to understand that the only way to see pedagogy is to see it not as an individual act, but as a social act, where we are learner and teacher at the same moment, where we are engaged, not disengaged, where we do not live on the balcony, where we are teachers and educators in the most ethical sense of that. I will end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for such an interesting lecture. Uh, we'll be taking questions and answers now. Uh, Paolo, uh, we may need the microphone so that uh, uh, it can be taped properly. It's coming. My name is Paul Bortis, I'm from the Faculty of Education. Um, what part? <laughs> what part? <laughs> um, 
I find your talk very thought provoking and uh, very extremely exciting. Quite exciting, I say. Um, How do I interpret that? <laughs> <laughs> you can choose. Um, take me to account that for example, I hope you know Louis Morley, um, that we are meant to provide for the needs of our students and most of the time our needs as professionals are not being provided for. And if you take into account as well what better common cause that teachers are being um, controlled and regulated to the uh, uh, to the every inch of our bodies um, and you proposing us to be a agents of change, um, how can critical pedagogy counteract hegemony in the new managerialized higher education to allow social justice to be practiced in the teaching and learning process and embedded in the curriculum in an environment where teachers and teaching are second to research? It's easier for me if I do one question at a time, if that's okay. Yeah. All right. um, so let me, otherwise I think specific points get lost and I speak at too general a level. First of all, I agree totally with you about what is happening to teachers at all levels. It is what I want to call management by stress. Okay. So it's clear, um, you know, if you've read any of my other material, you know that I've talked a lot about intensification and de-skilling. Uh, of teachers' lives at all levels. Um, one of the effects of neoliberalism is, again, to make, it, to make thinking itself a luxury, since there is no time to do that. In fact, the best description of teaching I have ever heard is by a friend of mine who teaches at a local secondary school, who's a history teacher. And I was saying, so, Gregory, how was your day? He said, once more, I didn't have time to go to the toilet. It's the best description of teaching I have ever heard in my life. Okay? So at all levels, there is this managerialism that I think is, in fact, you know, it's what Stephen Ball calls performativity. But this is not new. What is new is the sanctions that go with it. So as one example, right now, teachers in the United States at um, elementary, middle, and secondary schools are paid by test results. So it's like a factory. It's called performance pay. You are getting it here. right? It is now in Brazil. And the new reforms in China, by the way, are performance pay for teachers. So there is an added element here. The state has now taken on board a repressive form that says we will, in fact, hold you accountable. This is why I want to stress as well that this is, um, that this is not simply ruling class tailorism. This is in fact a particular fraction of the professional manager of the middle class that has carved out a sphere of autonomy and positions within the state apparatus. It is their ideology, measurement, accountability, performance, and I think this is crucial because in our action back, so much of the left talks about neoliberalism. It's neoliberalism all the time. If we could get the corporate sector out of schools, everything would be good. That's wrong. It is actually people often who vote new labor who are just as much in charge of the intensifying ideological mechanisms in schools as it is the right. So um, it's actually crucial because tactically it means that we have to think about where is this stuff coming from? And in order for us to then find the spaces within classrooms at university levels and elsewhere to interrupt it, we have to find where it's coming from. Where is its cause? Otherwise, I think it's more rhetoric about neoliberalism all the time. And that, I think, is simply incorrect, okay? Then back inside the, the issue of school. 
This is where it becomes, I think, easier, oddly enough. Um, I think that, first of all, uh, most places still have not just the fiction of autonomy, but the possibility of doing it even if you just shut the door. I don't mean that as a joke. I don't mean that little thing. Let me give an example of a pedagogy that might do this. In my, one of the classes I teach is in a class called elementary school curriculum. So that's the part of me that's sort of very practical. So I'm teaching people who, have, who are teachers now or want to be teachers. It's a master's level course. And many of them, if I were to talk about, we're going to read Paolo Freire, we're going to do critical pedagogy, you, know, you could see it's like any kid who asks you, Mr. Apple, is this going to be on the examination? And you say no, and you can, what the hell is this? So they're not, some of them are in there because they want very critical things. Others are in there because it's a requirement for being licensed. So, the worst thing I could do would be to say, we're going to ignore the realities of half the people in the room who are not necessarily interested initially in critical <coughs> things. So the first day, I say, look, what are the things we need to do in terms of busy work, administrative stuff in schools? I'm not in the classroom. Right? Who's going to bring snacks? Because it's in, the, it's in the evening, no one's eaten yet. And then I'll say, what do you want? I don't mean this to be cute now, now I want to get serious. The University of Wisconsin-Madison has its parking lots and its bus stops on dark streets. <coughs> the city, in its neoliberal agenda because of loss of taxes, has cut down the number of street lights. There has been violence against women repeatedly at the university. So one of the things the women wanted, women wanted, no matter what their ideological form was, is could we have a walk with each other to the parking lot and to the bus stops? So we began to organize that. I said, OK, what, what do you think this is about? Well, this society is not good for women. It's really a violent place for women. So look, does this resonate? with other people. And there are four African-American students in there, two men, two women, and then say, it's not just about violence, different kinds of violence. One out of every four African-American young men in my state, which is the most progressive state in the United States, are in prison right now under the control of the injustice system. And then the conversation proceeds. What started out with, what are we going to do to make it safe for parts of the class to um, walk, simply walk to the parking lot on the bus, begins to be a discussion about the ways in which schools and this society function as part of a repressive apparatus, and that the university, by acquiescing to taking the lights down, in its parking lots shows that the state is fully gendered. And the fact that there is a pipeline between kids being pushed out of schools and winding up in the state penitentiary within five years, if they're kids of color, we began to see coalitions that could be built between people of color and many white middle class women who may be progressive in pedagogic terms but have no real understanding of what it's like to be an oppressed person of color in my own university and in the society. Now that seems like such a small thing, but that's my point. Starting out with the levels of lived culture and people's experience, that is exactly what Paolo said. And then using that to read the word and the word. I don't mean that to be a silly, simple example. I want that to be used as a metaphor. So here it is. 
I am intensified, you are intensified, I've got to get through the stuff that I, you know, on the syllabus. But I can do that in a way that also shows the commonalities, what I call the decentered unities, using critical stuff that now we can talk more powerfully about what really is going on in this society and its influences on the places where they work and on their own lives. So I think that it is too easy for us to say, um, sir, there's nothing I can do. The danger of that is we leave it in the classroom. So I want to ask now, how do I form an alliance with other folks? I'll give one example. Right now, I have called for clerical workers and administrative staff to have one symbolic vote for what we call tenure at my university. That is, I want people who work, I can't do my work unless the secretary with whom I work does her work. I do not think any professor should have a right to say, here, honey, I need this by noon. Oh, where am I going? I need this by noon. That is, I want to begin to say what other kinds of alliances can get formed since all of us are being murdered, some physically, some emotionally, some professionally, by an apparatus that is as disrespectful of the labor of people paid and unpaid. So I want to ask, what are the things within the sphere that I have power that I can do? Now, it's part of the argument in Can Education Change Society? We, we have this thing that's called the society out there. Unless that changes, there's nothing I can do here. That's the worst possible position to take. Even if one is a vulgar mechanistic Marxist and says only paid labor counts. But by the way, um, there are Marxists who are not vulgar and are not mechanistic. You're looking at one of them, I hope. Right? So I have three legs, two of them within that tradition, and the third leg, you know, the whole array of stuff. But my point beside the joke is, even if you take the position paid labor is the only thing to transform, it's the economy all the time. Where the hell's the economy? This is the economy right here. People work for pay in this institution. They work for pay in schools. The lunch ladies, in quotes, are working. The secretaries are working. We are working at universities and schools, transforming the labor relations and social relations of each institution. That is the economy. Critical pedagogy is not just in the classroom. It's changing the relations in the institution itself. So when Paolo says, we are learners, it means one engages with others, as one would with oneself. That's Buber, too. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I went on. This is, I, I wrote, I just finished a whole book on this. So, so this is on my mind. So thank you. That was lecture 847. It's on tape. My work is in community development and community education. Um, and my life, when I'm not working, is in those places as well. Um, I'm interested in your comment about that is good and public is bad, and whether or not that's kind of a messy proposition now. Um, civil society can always be understood as a private concept. So my particular problem is the incorporation of civil society into the world of service provision. And um, many of those organisations that I've been a part of and that I've set up are now seen to be the new service providers and of course there are a whole series of, kind of regimes that come with that. So 
how to respond to these dilemmas. In one organisation, we, we made a decision not to take any money ever again. It's been a form of liberation, but you can imagine that life's very hard. But in another, every day, I just become more and more frantic that we're expected to implement policy that really our history should disallow. So I, I want you to perhaps problematise further this apparent distinction yeah. in the new realities. It's a very, very good question. Um, first of all, too often we have wedded the concept of public to the state. Um, I uh, argue quite strongly, again, very strongly, that it's social movements that are the engines of democratization right now. And social movements are part of civil society. So that means that we must think about those spaces where counter-publics are formed, when the state withdraws, then movements become even more important. So conceptually, I think that this binary doesn't work. And in reality, you know, one of the arguments that I, that I make in Can Education Change Society is exactly the power of social movements. Because in a society where the state has withdrawn from its social responsibilities. It means that the only space left is civil society. And by merging that constantly, using this binary, into, well, that's the private sector, it seems to me that that is a, not only disastrous theoretically, it actually doesn't respond dramatically to the transformations that are going on, where the engines of social transformations actually are being built. Right? So it means now that this is this is very vexed because what does what that, that leads us into well what would your position be on NGOs? Well that depends. So I do not want to romanticize civil society either, but I agree totally with you that this binary that the left uses and certainly the right uses as its organizing metric. You, know, you see the worlds, the glasses they put on. Right? This public is good and bad private is good. That the left reproduces that. I think that's a, that is a, a real danger. So it seems to me that the political dilemma is how do you defend those parts of the state that still have a function of democratization where tax dollars which still must be collected and still support national health services, a national schooling system that is democratized radically. How do you do that at the same time as you don't romanticize the state? So remember, yeah, this is puzzling because basically the only Leninists left are the right, the only no, the only good state is the dead state. I don't want to get into that. So, uh, since uh, I'm trying to remember, were you at the cooperative? Yes, yeah, right. right. And you raised a similar issue uh, there. So, um, you, uh, now it seems to me that this is important for anyone who's concerned with issues such as cooperative schooling. That is, I think, the practical implications of what do we support if it's not fully public in our traditional sense of that. Do we then automatically say, no? Well, wait a minute, Paolo worked with community groups and community literacy practices that were not supported by the state. This is interesting. So, so I, I have a complicated sense about this. And I'm, I must admit, I'm not certain where I want to go with that. Because when you open that door and say, it's civil society, that doesn't mean that you're, that's going to that the people who walk through that door are going to agree with your politics and your vision of a, or a more robust democratic public sphere, public in the, in the sense of movement sphere. And I'm not certain, I think we've lost that tradition in many nations of trying to think outside the state, but call it, seeing it as doing public functions, robust public functions that are committed to social justice. And that space has been reoccupied by NGOs. And having spent a lot of time worrying about NGOs, they make me very, very nervous. Okay, 
That's a great question. Great question. Thank you again. Um, this was really fascinating. You mentioned earlier um, the idea of the need to inhabit the, the, the space in which pedagogical practice is actually done on the space of, of the realities um, of schooling. And um, one of the things that, that um, I think troubles me is that there seems to be this kind of um, ability of the, the kind of professional culture of measurement to appropriate and to imitate uh, anything that attempts to be done in the name of kind of liber liberation pedagogy in a sense that, uh, for example, um, some of my researchers are looking at religious education in schools, which is a site of a lot of uh, dialogue within the British education system around multiculturalism, interculturalism, uh, moral and social questions. And yet, even there, um, it's subordinated to the need for high status examinations, you know, by subsidiary companies of Pearson. And so, we find this difficulty that teachers are genuinely engaging with, that they do want students to engage with these complex, you know, first order questions, social questions, questions of their, of their reality. But yet they also have to realize that for most of the students, the purpose of this class is to get an A so that they can go on uh, to further study, so that they can you know, get out of difficult uh, material circumstances. And so there's, there always seems to be this tension of limitation between um, a kind of um, a more um, emancipatory education and, and, and the culture of measurement. And I just wonder, do you have any suggestions as to the resolution of that of, of, of that reality? <sighs> the simple question, the simple answer is, of course, no. Um, but I wish it was that simple. First of all, I think you're exactly correct. A good example in the history of curriculum development in the United States, but not in religious education, um, was in the arts. Um, so. During the time uh, in the 70s and 80s when um, it, the initial attempts of de-skilling teachers, of making curricula that were teacher-proof, as it was called at the time, um, a large aesthetic-oriented uh, laboratory that is one of the federally funded laboratories to build teacher education materials and curriculum materials put out a box curriculum for the arts called Semel. C-E-M-R-E-L. I can't remember, thank goodness, what those initials stand for, but it must be dirty. And just it's, uh, um, but, or, or it should be. And that was a scripted aesthetics. Thing. So, teachers say the following. Children look outside. Is it cloudy? Sunny? What color are the clouds? And then it lists for the teacher Acceptable answers are gray, because you want kids to imagine clouds, but you're going to give them the possible colors. Okay. Now, that is not a joke. So there is a very long history, again, of taking the skills that come. Teaching is an art form in and of itself. It's not reducible to simple behaviors. And we know that. Right? Um, but there have been constant attempts by measurement experts, by the epistemological experts, who say in many ways it's, you know, it's Habermas's understanding in many ways that the, the Liebenswelt, the life world, would be eaten by purpose of rational action patterns. And that takes its form in education through a de-skilling process that you must know where you're going beforehand and that must be certified by testing, uh, whether it's moral education, in quotes, or immoral, um, or whether it's the arts, or whether it's mathematics, whether it's science, etc. Uh, we now have it in many nations where uh, you, know, you, you ask students to read 
a, a piece of literature and then you ask them about plot structure, but there's no imagination. Right? So that becomes you know, their regard. It's just pro forma. So I, I think that empirically you're, you're remarkably correct. We can trace this, by the way, in education in this nation and my own to the popular eugenics movement. Right? So this, this occurs um, in the United States with Watson and Thorndike. And here, even before the twin studies with Burt, with Galton, etc., with his vision, and it's a, an epistemological movement that says what is knowable must be speakable. It's what's called in philosophy logical atomism. It must be a world of facts. So we will reduce it to that. So complicated moral principles must be able to be reducible to law-like statements. Now, this um, clearly is having an effect in classrooms now, and it's higher stakes. And it's higher stakes internationally. So I was in a classroom in Korea where the true education movement, which is their social justice teacher union, that was illegal for many years and then uh, was uh, then made legal. But the students in the class, it's where I got my example of, of young kids going to sleep, will ask the teacher, in a primary school, Mr. Kim, and it was Mr. Kim I was in his class with, um, will this be on the examination? He'll smile and say, no, and they put their books there. That's it. We don't, and what the, what the lesson, in quotes, was about was the history of military dictatorships, the history of insurgent movements, and the importance of students beginning to work through moral dilemmas but what is it like if your family, the more the one they were dealing with it, what is it like if your family, your job is dependent on the money you get from this repressive regime? What's the appropriate moral act? That's really powerful. That's what I would love kids to work through. But as soon as the teacher said, it's not on the examination, it's not there. Now, teachers, in, in quotes, in training will raise exactly the same things. Right? And this is a very real issue. And often the solution is, not one I agree with, we just ignore the real issues. We say, you are the leader in this group. You are, as neoliberals would say, you are our clients or our customers. Excuse me, you're my student. You're not my customer. You're not my client. Right? You, yeah, I have a vision, and we will negotiate this, but I really think there's important things for you to know. That's why I'm here. Right? And I will allow you to criticize me, and we will have a dialogue about that, which is part of the answer. Right? But it's also, it seems to me, this paradox of how you engage in a more critical pedagogic form that asks people to critique exactly their education, and at the same time grade them which is reproducing the form. So here's my personal solution. I think the right has colonized the space of standards. I actually have very, very high standards. I think this stuff is really hard to understand at times, and it takes hard work. It's no easier than a complicated statistics course. So when I was a grad student, we had study groups on my statistics examinations. We went crazy about it. We also have study groups about Wittgenstein. We have a lot of study groups. So what I do is to say this, and it's, I have to be honest, it's extra later. You're going to write your papers for the class. We're going to negotiate about them. We're going to talk about it. If I think that it's not very good, I'm going to give it back to you. You can rewrite it as often as you want. You can speak to me as often as you want. I will hold a tutorial with you, and we will dialogue about this, and I will regrade it. It would not bother me if everybody gets an A. That's our grading system. But you're going to have to do some serious thinking. But it means that I cannot tell them work harder if I'm not willing to work harder myself. Now, I am lucky enough, and here I have to be honest, I am lucky enough not to teach a course where every, these seats would be filled. 
So my biggest course would be about 40 people. But that means that about 10 people, I'm giving their work back and saying, here's tons of comments. So I, now if you're willing to work harder, I'll meet with you as often as you want, and you'll get your A. But that requires me to be, to work my ass, excuse me, to work harder. Um, I don't know whether, that, that's a partial solution, but it's not one I'm totally satisfied with, because I think this is a paradox. As Marx once said, you know, you know, people make their own history, you and I and everybody else, but never under conditions of their own choosing. And I think these are contextual. I know what I can do. And there are times I've come home to, you know, and say to Rima, oh man, I gotta reread all these things again. And she'll smile and say, well, that was your choice. It's a choice I have to make because that's my solution. Whether I make the same solution in a class like this, you know, that is where these seats are filled, when I don't have time to pee, hmm, I have a feeling my compromise might be different. So that's, a, you'll forgive the personal response, but I think it is a dilemma that is not solvable in abstract terms. But it's really real, and if we don't feel it, then there's something wrong. So thanks again, another great question. Modification, even amongst the students, you know, it, it's a qualification they're going for, not an education, and they're paying for it. At the same time, we've got the casualisation of labour of all the professionals and the insecurities that gets them. And because of that insecurity, a lot of people have to go along with things that they uh, wouldn't want to do, and so there's unhappiness if, if throughout the whole system, and, and and a disillusion to come for the students who are coming up with a form of paper qualification that we all know is perhaps not what it should be. Um, and yet, and you've mentioned that in, the, in America, the homeschool, the right, have begun to take action about their disillusion with the system. We've got nothing like that on the left. Uh, I, I mean, I'm an advocate of Matthew Lippmann's program. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that can do a lot to, to, to um, emancipate children and make them critical systems in the future. But the left hasn't embraced it massively. I don't know what the left's doing, really, apart from crying <laughs> um, and going home with too many papers and having breakdowns. Um, and I'm a graduate from this, from this city. I, um, I had a relatively privileged education from a working class woman, and I finished my first degree feeling stuffed, full of stuff. It wasn't until later on I found things I wanted to do that it unlocked my intellectual capacity. If I'd had to pay for that, I'd have been a very angry graduate. Um, so I don't know, where is the left? Where is the left? I'd like to find it, but um, I don't know where it is, and I don't know of any organised movement which is looking at alternatives. Sorry, that was a bit long. Again, thank you. It's a very, very interesting, very interesting question. Um, first of all, one of the things that the right has done is, as I mentioned, to destroy the collective memory possibilities. So I think that you're correct that the left is fragmented, in part because the traditional left, you know, the joke that I made for my grandfather about when the left lines up in a firing squad, it lines up in a circle, I think is accurate. That is, there is, it seems to be in many nations, an unwillingness to listen to the multiplicity of progressive mobilizations and movements. Those are all over. It's not as if, what, what is invisible is those movements, not to the movement folks. When I talk about sort of reality being like, you know, the media being like reality with 99 stations playing, stuff that makes people feel cynical, that that is a reality. 
And it's not that the left doesn't exist. It's that the left, whatever that means, and that's a contentious term now, is not very good in making its solutions visible. So I gave the example of that little book that Jim Bean and I did called Democratic Schools, which is here's re the reality of in real schools with real testing and tons of papers to grade, et cetera, of real schools doing remarkable things and poor kids doing well on the test, by the way. A half a million copies. That either means that people have false consciousness, or there are all kinds of folks throughout this society and others who are doing interesting things and who want to do even more interesting things. But we are lamentably insecure, and I think not very talented in making those things visible. That's why I talked about it in one of the tasks of becoming media savvy. So I do a lot of talk radio. In the United States, that's crucial. And the right has occupied that space, where one of them is Rush Limbaugh. He talks about women activists as feminazis. It's really despicable stuff. And 40 million people listen to that. Where's the left in talk radio? So we have to find ways of talking in multiple registers so that people can hear the possibility of solutions where the left is not talking all the time in abstractions, not dealing with the real issues that people have in their daily lives. And I think that that's because we have partly participated in the de-skilling of ourselves. And I think that is truly dangerous. The Lippmann stuff is really interesting. Um, I know Matthew, um, and in fact, uh, I was a consultant on some of that stuff. I worry a little bit about that because it was more technical than I would like it. I, you know, again, I have a background, my master's degree is in philosophy, um, both continental and analytic. I, I like that stuff. On the other hand, like Paolo Freire and a, a whole tradition, I think that philosophy must be about something. And I want it about quite critical things. That is, I want it about inequalities. I want it about the daily life of what it's like with moral dilemmas that kids in rural areas and inner city schools face every day. So I want to take the technologies, that is, the, the, the conceptual apparatus that is really powerful, and I want to apply it in a way that's really, really connected to real kids' lives. And I think the Lippmann stuff is the first step. And I would prefer that we then take the analytic techniques of stepping back, thinking, etc., and then engage them with the real life experiences. Because otherwise, it becomes one more elitist tool. And that, unfortunately, is the way this is too often seen. But some of the stuff I've seen, for instance, in Palestinian schools, or when I was in, for instance, uh, uh, in some of the townships around Cape Town, in some of the schools and literacy centers, where the ideas of stepping back, thinking about the assumptions, etc., that, that people have, and applied to apartheid, and why there's no money coming into this school, why for the white and Afrikaner schools it's 10 times as much money going to them at that time, or in Israel right now, three to six times more money going into Jewish schools versus Palestinian schools. I want to apply to that, the stuff that really grabs people. And I've, I've seen some remarkable stuff on that, that Lippmann and Matthew would be proud of it. OK? The last thing, again, you mentioned the risk. I, write, I, I say a lot about this in Can Education Change Society. I do, not, I do not have the right to tell people what risk to take. That's really arrogant. So in saying this, if I'm going to be serious, and I think all of us, be serious. If I'm not willing to take the risk myself, I don't have any business saying to people, what's wrong with you? So as an example, this is not meant as a cover your ass statement. You know, when I was working with the illegal teachers union, I got arrested with them. That's scary, really scary. And anyone who's been arrested in a demonstration who doesn't say it's scary as playing games. But if I'm not willing to put myself on the line, 
How can I then tell people, do these nine things? So it, it actually provides a space for talking about the issue that was raised about moral dilemmas. Right? It's easy for me to say certain things when I've got the John Baskin Distinguished Professorship. And if I'm not willing to give that up, and not visibly willing to say this privilege gives me the privilege to speak. But I sure as hell better understand that that is a privilege that I must be willing to put at risk. And I have no business saying these kinds of things. So I, I think you know, your point is really actually one of the most important points that has to be made. What has happened with much of the critical tradition is we have academicized the political rather than politicizing the academic. And that is a grave danger. So thank you again for a powerful issue that you raised. Thank you. Um, I'm just being conscious of the time because we are going over 5 o'clock. And uh, uh, so I would like to leave things here. Uh, there is refreshments outside. And uh, Michael Apple will be available as well to sign copies of his books. So there will be a book signing event. Uh, so thank you very much for everybody who has come out and to Michael Apple as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.